Okay, well, I know it's six o'clock and uh, I think we're gonna wait another 30 or 40 seconds to let people in as they're uh, getting, getting all set up here. And then we'll go ahead and get started. All right, well, hello everybody. My name is Carol Crosby. I'm the president and CEO of the Whittier Chamber. I'd like to welcome you all and thank you for joining us for this second workshop on our four part workshop series, our boot camp for uh, financial boot camp for small businesses. Our first one was awesome um, and it has been recorded and that recording is available to you. Um, and we will be recording this one as we are right now. And again, it'll be made available to you in case you want to, you missed one or in case you want to watch it again. So um, tonight we're going to be talking about understanding your financials, which I know is a super scary thing. And we're very happy to have Mike here to help uh, guide us through that and explain all the things. Lots of numbers, but there's a lot of information between those lines that you need to know when you run a business. So uh, Mike will work us, work us through that and walk us through that. Uh, the Whittier Chamber is proud to partner with the Long Beach Small Business Development Center to offer these workshops to you. Um, and they're intended to help us uh, help your business thrive and help our community thrive. So we couldn't be prouder to, uh, to offer these to you. I'd also like to thank uh, Friendly Hills Bank, our corporate sponsor, uh, particularly new president and CEO Nathan Rogue and executive vice president Liz Buckingham. I'd like to thank them for their support today. Friendly Hills Bank has local branches in Whittier and Santa Fe Springs and offers a personalized approach to banking. Their experienced team focuses on delivering exceptional customer service and building relationships with their clients, which include small and medium-sized businesses. To introduce this evening's instructor and to tell you more about what this workshop is going to entail, I'm going to turn it over to Brad Pollock, Director of the Long Beach Small Business Development Center. Brad. Thank you, Carol. Thanks so much for that. Appreciate it big time. And thanks to you and to your whole Whittier Chamber team and Rick and just really great to be partnering with you. And we're also super, super glad and, and, and grateful for the sponsorship of Friendly Hills Bank. So much appreciate that. I think uh, before I get into describing a little bit about what we're doing, uh, for those of you um, here, we got any way to kind of mute the whole enchilada. There we go. Excellent. Um, so uh, before I sort of get into talking for a moment about what we're doing this evening, if you'd like to type in the chat, if you'd like to type what business you're in, maybe the name of your business or the industry you're in, if you just put that in the chat, that'll be uh, super helpful to us as we move forward. So again, my, my name is Brad Pollock, and I'm the director of the Long Beach Small Business Development Center, which is also known as the SBDC. And the SBDC offers business advising to businesses that are getting started and to businesses that are growing. And we're very, very excited to be here tonight um, as part of this financial boot camp series. And we put it together with, with the Whittier Chamber of Commerce and with Friendly Hills Bank because over the last few years, especially at the SBDC, we've noticed that there have been a lot of questions about the world of financials. And a lot of businesses are have been in interesting situations when trying to secure a loan and not necessarily having all of their financials together and being a little bit mystified about how to, uh, how to do all those things. And they're mystified by what financial statements are and so on and so forth. And there's absolutely no reason for there to be, for it to be a mystery. So we put together this financial boot camp, which is four sessions. The, the first one was last week taught by SBDC <coughs> advisor, Steve Richardson, uh, who talked about the, financial, the, the fundamentals of a small business, very important starting uh, point. And this evening, SPDC advisor Mike Huntley will be talking about how to understand your financials and demystify some of that language. And then two weeks from tonight, not next week because of Memorial Day, but two weeks from tonight, we'll be offering the third 
which is uh, going to be taught by SBDC advisor Max Ordonez, who's going to be talking about what's involved in securing a loan. And everything that Steve Richardson will have been talking about, that Mike Huntley will, will have been talking about, will tie in with what Max is talking about. And then on the fourth session, which is Monday, June 13th, also at six o'clock, we'll have a panel with uh, Steve and Mike and Max on the panel, and I'll, I'll moderate it. And we will recap a lot of what's been discussed and also be there to answer any questions that you have based on everything that you've been listening to throughout the series. So it's a really comprehensive, helpful series about how to demystify the world of, of financials. And uh, this evening, is uh, the class is being taught by SPDC advisor Mike Huntley, who's a very experienced business advisor, has over 30 years of experience in sales and marketing and finance and international import, export. He's, uh, you know, just very, very well versed. But tonight it's about understanding financials. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Mike, to, to, to take it away. And again, if you have the opportunity, please put the name of your business or whatever industry you're in, in the chat so we can have a sense of, of the world in which... Um, we're operating right now. So Mike, thank you so much. And I hand it over to you, sir. Thank you. Thanks for coming everybody tonight. So um, I'm not an accountant, right? And I've had to learn over the years how to understand these financial reports. And that's why I put this workshop together. Um, so if you've got questions as we go, please feel free to, uh, to ask them. You can put them in the chat. And let me get my screen going and we will hit the ground running. Okay, so tonight it's understanding your finances. Um, and we're gonna start off, here's my contact information. As Brad said, we work out of the Small Business Development Center. Used to be meeting with clients in person. COVID changed all that. We do it all virtually now. My email is here. Brad has contact information. Carol has contact information for us. And we meet with clients like you guys one-on-one -on -one to help you grow your business. Okay, so let's jump into this. The basic premise of tonight is that accounting is confusing. And I jokingly say on purpose. And what I mean by that is accountants use different terms for common things that we all understand. And I jokingly say that accountants do it to create jobs for themselves. I'm not an accountant. I don't know if that's true, but that's kind of the premise of tonight. So I'm, by the time we get through this, you're gonna understand a lot more about your financial reports and how accountants think, okay? So let's start with a glossary, if you will. We need to speak their language. So this is a list on the left, hand side in red are common accounting terms, and on the right are common things that we all understand. You're gonna find in accounting, there's often two terms that go together. So let's start asset and liability. An asset is something that has value. So let's say that's your car. Liability is something you owe to somebody else. So you've got your car, but you have a car loan, okay? So you have a liability there. Credit and debit. A credit is something that somebody owes you. So let's say a paycheck. You go to work for somebody, you sign an employment offer, and they agree to pay you once a month, twice a month, whatever it is, a paycheck. You don't get all that money up front, but you have a credit for that money coming to you. The other side of that is a debit, which is like your rent. So you sign a lease at the first of each month, you're gonna make a rent payment, that's your debit. Accounts payable and accounts receivable. Accounts payable is something that you get a statement, you've already you know, received the goods or service, now you gotta pay the money, like your credit card bill. Accounts receivable is the other side. It's money that people owe you. So you submit your taxes, you're gonna get a refund. Your tax refund is like accounts receivable. Capital and cash flow. Capital, the value of everything you own, okay? And, and cash flow is just like your checkbook, keeping track of money coming in, money going out, okay? Cost of goods sold is another accounting term, which is the cost of something that you sell, okay? And then the last two terms on here, we're gonna drill down into 
because these are two of the most common financial reports that you might see from your bookkeeper or your CPA at the end of each month or at the end of a year. Profit and loss statement, some people call it a P&L statement, and a balance sheet. A profit and loss statement is a scorecard, nothing more than that. So you know whether you're winning or losing. And a balance sheet, not to be morbid, but it's what your heirs get when you die. And that'll, make, that'll become a little more clear when we drill down into a balance sheet and what makes that up. Okay, so now we have a glossary of what accountant, terms that accountants are, accountants are using and a common understanding for each of them. I might flip back and forth a little bit a couple of times so we get used to this. But let's go into a profit and loss statement. Now remember I said this is a scorecard. So a profit and loss statement, most businesses run these at the end of each month and at the end of a year. So I've made one up here. The time period is 2020, the year 2021, from January 1st to December 31st. And let's just work our way down this. So we've got sales, or sometimes called revenue. We had a million dollars in sales. Cost of goods sold. That's the cost of something that we sell. So to make this example a little clearer let's say this is a profit and loss statement for my business and my business makes bow ties right nobody wears a tie anymore i'm not wearing a tie but let's just say my business makes bow ties so i sold a million dollars worth of bow ties and my cost to make those bow ties the material the thread to sew it together the labor to cut it and sew it was six hundred thousand dollars so my gross profit is the difference between those two, $400,000. I'm thinking, oh my God, I made $400,000. Not quite. Because I've got all these things called operating expenses. Operating expenses are things that you've got to pay just to be in business, whether I sell one bow tie or a million of them. So this would include your rent, your salaries for people that are not making bow ties, maybe that's my salary. Um, you have health insurance, you have business insurance, telephone and internet, advertising and marketing, freight, repair and maintenance, bank fees, uniforms. This could be a whole variety of things that are not expenses you have that are not related to, in my case, making my bow ties. So then my total operating expenses, the total of all of these is $300,000. So what I'm left over with is net income. My net income, I made $100,000. Okay, so now what I'd like to do, it's a little bit daring, but I'm willing to walk this tightrope. I'd like you to unmute yourself because I want to use, I want to make sure you understand this. And I want to ask you a question about my business, okay? You guys un figure out how to unmute yourself and I'm gonna tell you with the scenario. So let's make the math easy. Let's say in 2021, I sold 1 million bow ties. They cost me a dollar each. I sell them for a dollar each. They cost me 60 cents each to make. So I make 40 cents on each one of them, okay? So it's the beginning of the year. My sales manager comes to me and says, Mike, I'm doing a forecast for 2022. It's going to be exactly like 2021. We're going to sell a million bow ties, a dollar a piece. So our sales for 2022 are going to look exactly the same. I said, okay, I know how to plan for that. Now, into the year, maybe the middle of January, Walmart calls me up. Walmart says, you know what, Mike? We think bow ties are going to blow up in 2022. So we want to buy a million bow ties, but we don't want to pay a dollar each. We want to pay 70 cents each. So we'll give you an order for a million bow ties and we'll give and it'll be worth $700,000. So I go, okay, now I got to decide, am I taking the Walmart order or not? I got a million dollars already. My sales manager says I'm going to have in sales. Now I'm going to have another 700, 700,000 on top of the million if I take the Walmart deal. The question to you guys is, with what I've already taught you in the last five minutes and your opinion, 
Are you taking the Walmart deal or not? Anybody? And the room goes silent. Aren't you coming in with the same net income? The same net income. Okay, so are you going to take the Walmart deal? No, you got the same operating expenses. Let's make this easy. You got the same operating expenses, right? So if we took the Walmart deal, my sales would be a million dollars for my original customers plus 700,000. So my sales would, total sales would be 1.7. I cost me $600,000 to make a million units. So my cost is going to be 1.2 million. And my gross profit's going to be 500,000. Because I make 100,000 off the Walmart sales, I make 400,000 off everybody else. So my gross profit's 500,000. Let's make the math easy and say all my operating expenses are the same, 300,000. So my net income goes up if I take the Walmart deal from 100,000 to 200,000. So are you taking the deal or not? Yes. Yes. Okay, now tell, tell me if you, so give me a yes or no, and then tell me why you're doing it. So somebody said yes, tell me, tell me why you're doing it. You double your net income. Double my net income, perfect. Okay, who else? Come on, I'm not that bad of a teacher. Come on, <laughs> come on. Well, I mean, that, I was thinking the same thing here. That's okay. That's okay. It can be the same thing. You could just say ditto. So I got two people are taking the deal because they're going to make, they're going to increase their net income by $100,000. Perfect answer. Who else? It's not the only answer. It's just a perfect answer. I'll say no. Okay. And why are you going to say no, Steve? I'm saying no because that type of prop, gross profit margin is not worth it to me. And the added labor and everything else, and the t and the stress. I'd rather go out and find more jobs at the right profit margin, rather than just take the Walmart deal and work for pennies. Perfect, perfect. Okay, so who else? Who else is going to tell me whether they're going to take this or not? Okay, oftentimes when I teach this class, students ask me, Mike, would you take the deal? And my answer is, I would take the deal. So all of your answers are perfectly correct. My answer is I would take the deal, but what I would do before I'd sign the contract with Walmart is I would go to my raw material supplier. And I would say, look, let's just say that out of my $600,000 cost of goods, let's just say 500,000 of that is the textile, is the material that my bow ties are made out of. I'm going to my textile supplier and I say, look, buddy, I'm going to double your business this year, but I need a better price. So rather than spending $500,000 worth of material to make a million bow ties, for my current customers and another 500,000 to make another million for Walmart, rather than spending a million dollars with him, I'm gonna say, I need, to, I need you to, to give me that material for $800,000 or whatever the number is. Because whatever money I can save from him is gonna go to the bottom line. It's gonna increase my net income. Any questions on this? profit and loss statement, what we did with the Walmart deal. You guys were amazing with your answers. Any questions on this? So you're saying you could have gone either way, right? You could have gone either way. But the, 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 the main point of this exercise is, so it is now 620. I've been talking to you for 15 minutes. The assumption was 15 minutes ago that accounting was confusing. But in 15 minutes, I showed you what a profit and loss statement was, and you understood it enough so that you had an opinion whether you could take the Walmart deal or not. My point is this stuff is not that confusing. And if you understand how to use a profit and loss statement like we just did with this Walmart deal, 
you can more effectively manage your business. Okay? So these are not just numbers in a report that you get from your bookkeeper each month, is my point. The other thing that effective business owners and managers do is all these operating expenses, $300,000. You got to spend this whether you make one bow tie or not. What can we do to reduce this? Right? I mean, some of this is tough. Health insurance, well, okay, it's going to be expensive. Rent. I mean, could we go so far as to say we're not going to make the bow ties ourselves? We're just going to be a distribution center and we're going to outsource it to Mexico and have somebody make our bow ties for us in Mexico? Then I don't need to have this big a space, right? Because every dollar I can save on operating expenses is going to increase my net income, right? So when you get a profit and loss statement, go back and look at the last one that you got and see if you can understand it a little differently after what we just went through. Any questions on this before I go on to balance sheet? So far, so good. Okay, thanks. Okay, balance sheet. Not to be morbid, but this is what your heirs get. God forbid you get hit by a bus tomorrow. Let's say it's me. It's my bow tie company, right? I have three amazing kids. This is what they get, okay? So we got three parts of this. This is a balance sheet as of the end of last year, okay? So that's the year we just saw where I made $100,000. I have assets. Oh, I know what that is, Mike. Those are things of value. You said that was like my car, okay? So I got cash, I got current assets, things that I can turn into cash quickly, right? I got cash, checking account, savings account, accounts receivable. Oh, you told me that one, Mike. That's, excuse me, somebody owes me money, like my tax refund. And then I got inventory. So these are bow ties I've already made that I could just sell. So my total current assets, things that can be cash quickly, $520,000. Then I got other assets, which is going to take me longer to turn that into cash. I got property. Let's say I own my building and I got equipment. That's 70000 So my total assets, the things my kids think they're going to get is $590,000. Okay? The problem is I got liabilities. That's where I owe somebody some money, right? So I got accounts payable. Oh, that's like my credit card bill. So I already got the raw material to make my bow ties. Now I got to pay those bills, right? And then long-term liabilities. Maybe this is a loan on when I brought, bought the building or bought the equipment, right? So I got total liabilities, money I owe to somebody else, $180,000. And what's left over is equity. That's what my kids get right? So beginning equity, this is money I put into the business, 200000 Retained earnings. These are, so on the profit and loss statement, it said we made $100,000. But let's say I don't take all of that out of the business. I leave it in the business. Retained earnings. And then net income, I put $20,000 for, this is for this period, so the total owner equity is $410,000. This is what my kids get, okay? So a profit and loss statement that you get at the end of each month is a scorecard. Did I make money or not make money? The balance sheet is what do your heirs get, okay? So if you're going to, let's say you're looking at buying another business. You'd want to look at their balance sheet because you could have a balance sheet where, in, in this case, my liabilities, what I owe to other people, is less than the things that I have of value. So this is a pretty healthy balance sheet, right? Worst case, I could pull some cash out or sell some inventory, come up with enough money to pay off my liabilities, right? So I'm in pretty good shape here. And the owner has $410,000 worth of equity. So any questions on the balance sheet? 
and where you'd use this or what it's telling you about your business. When you start off, it's not uncommon to have negative owner equity because you're still putting money into the business as it starts to take off and grow. Any questions on balance sheet? Can you talk a little bit about um, how often it's worth looking at your balance sheet when you're running a business? How often do you check in? I mean, for a small business, it probably doesn't make sense to really look that closely at a balance sheet month to month. You probably want to look at it every three to six months. Um, you definitely want to look at it at the end of each year and compare that to the year before to see how you're doing on a year to year basis. But that's a good question. And is the balance sheet going to look exactly like this for everyone? And obviously the numbers are going to be different, but in terms of the assets laid out, the liabilities and the equity, this is what they will look like versus the profit and loss where it's going to obviously vary depending on your business. Well, um, yeah, to answer your question, yes. The, the three basic components of the balance sheet, assets, liability, and equity, are always going to be on the balance sheet. And the categories, you're, you're, you're going to have current assets and other assets. You're going to have current liability and other liabilities. And you're going to have different types of equity. So yes, it's always going to look like this. And the same thing with the profit and loss statement. It's always going to have the major categories. Sales or revenue, gross profit, operating expenses, and net income. And if your report has different terms or looks different than these and you've got questions, please reach out to us. We can help you. Mike? Yes. So I noticed that if you add up the liabilities, which is 180,000 and, and the equity, total owner equity is 410,000, that comes to 590, 590,000 right? That's it. Yep. So is that how you get the term balance for you, your, your assets? It's almost like you went to the next slide. Got it. Yes, exactly. That's what it is. It has to balance. Assets minus liability is going to equal equity. Yep. Hence the expression <laughs> Hence the expression. Balance sheet. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions on balance sheet? Or profit and loss statement for that matter? Okay. Uh, Mike, how, how are balance sheets used when if, an, if a small business is looking to sell their business? And how many years of balance sheets do they need to be looking at? So... Um, that's a good question. So typically, I mean, with what happened in 2020, that was obviously an anomaly, but I think if you could look at balance sheets for three years with the pandemic, you probably want to look at four years to see what the business was doing in 2019 before the pandemic hit. Um, and a simple formula that you can use to value your business would be assets. So let's say we're going to use these numbers to value this, my bow tie business, right? I wouldn't include the, the cash and the checking account savings account. I would take that. And that's $300,000 here, right? So... If I'm going to say my assets are worth 290,000 because I had 590 and I kept the cash here which was 300,000. So 290,000 is my assets plus my net income which was $100,000 times a multiplier. A multiplier is subjective depending upon how long you've been in business, what type of business you're in, what industry you're in, 
and how consistently you've made a profit or grown a profit. But you probably could use, if you're an established business, you probably could use a multiplier of three. So if we're gonna value this business, it's gonna be my net income, my annual net income times three. So there's $300,000 plus my assets, which was 290,000. So roughly $690,000 is a way to value this business. And the balance sheet is a critical part of that formula. Make sense? Yep, thanks. Okay. Anybody else have any questions about profit and loss or balance sheets? There's not a quiz, okay? This is not an accounting final, okay? Okay. As I said before, this is the basic formula on the balance sheet. Assets minus liabilities equals your equity, okay? So now we're gonna talk about cash because cash is everything in a business, right? So this is a simple, cash flow model that you can use to manage your cash. And then the next slide I'm gonna talk about, show you a different way that you can use this model to manage uh, special extra expenses that you may have and managing your cash to be able to get through those times when you got big expenses or your sales are down. But let's talk about, let's go through how this basic cash flow model works. So when you're looking at managing the cash in your business, it's best to go week to week as opposed to month to month because things will be due, you know, rent's due the first of the month. And it'll give you a clearer picture if you can look at it week to week. So this model works by going down week by week. So we start off with $50,000 in cash, okay? Then I go down and I have my outgoing cash, things that I've got to pay. So I got to pay salaries, I got to pay rent, and I got to pay accounts payable, which is like to my vendors, right? My textile guy. So in week one, I start with 50,000, I got 35,000 going out. Incoming cash is in green, I got nothing coming in. No customers paying me any money week one. So I end up week one with $15,000. That's where I start week two, $15,000. Okay, luckily I don't have to pay anybody in week two. I got nothing going out. And I'm gonna get a check for $35,000 from a customer. So I'm back to $50,000 at the end of week two. That's where I start week three. Week three, I gotta pay my utilities. So I got 1,500 going out. I got nothing coming in. I end week three at 48,500. And that's where I start week four. Week four, I gotta pay a big insurance bill, $12,000. I got nothing coming in. So I end the week at 36,500. And that's where I start week five. I gotta pay my taxes. I gotta make another payment to my vendors. So I got $24,000 going out. I got 5,000 coming in from a customer. So I end week five at 17,500. So this is a real simple way to keep track of your cash, right? If you, you know, I, I use this for my business. Um, and typically it doesn't make any sense for me to look out probably more than three months. So your business, maybe it's longer for you or maybe it's shorter. Maybe your, your sales cycle and your cash cycle is much shorter. But if you're looking at this on, let's say, a three-month time period, and you can track your cash going in and out, let's say you end up with a situation like in this next slide. So this is what started me building this cash flow model for my business. Everything is the same in what we had the slide before. The only thing I've changed is I've added this line here for tooling. I had a situation where I was gonna to have to spend $40,000 in tooling for a project that I was working on. 
And so I wanted to see if I had enough cash to pay for that. Well, knowing how this model works, start week one, cash going out week one, cash coming in week one, end up with available cash at the end of week one, $15,000. That's the same as the slide before. That's where I start week two. Now I got this $40,000 tooling charge going out. That's going to kill me. Well, I got a $35,000 check coming in from a customer. So at the end of week two, I still got some cash, right? I got $10,000. Week three, I'm starting with that $10,000. Luckily, I only have to pay $1,500 in utilities. So I end week three at $8,500. Or $8, that's where I start week four. Then I got to pay salaries. I'm negative. What am I going to do? Well, by using this cash flow model, I got a four week head start on when I'm going to run out of cash. So I can try to do a different thing. Let's say I go back to this tooling vendor and I say, look, how about I pay you $10,000 a month for the next four months? And I'll put interest on there. I'll pay you $11,000 each month for four months. So rather than paying $40,000 for my tooling, I'll pay $44,000. But for me, it's worth it because I don't have to go get a loan. I don't have to use a line of credit. I don't have to put it on my credit card. Or So that's one thing you could do to try to, to you know, make sure you don't run any cash. Maybe you got another invoice out here for another $35,000 in week six. And you go to that customer and you say, look, if you could pay me in week three, I'll discount your invoice. I'll take $32,000, right? Because I'm using this cash flow model and it's given me some visibility on when I'm gonna run out of cash, I can try to do different things to manage my cash. So any questions on this model or how to use it? Seems like it's a really, understanding the cash flow uh, model seems to really offer some advanced planning to negotiate with vendors in case you need to do that. You know, you're, you're, if you're anticipating that you're gonna be short, you can go back and negotiate, as you were saying before. It seems like that's a huge part of how this is helpful. Exactly. And this model was really helpful with a lot of our clients when the pandemic hit all of us. Because even if you had PPP money or idle money coming in, you still have expenses. If you're still negotiating with your landlord to push off your rent for a few months, or you still got employees that you're paying, but you don't have any cash coming in, a cash flow model like this would help you manage that cash much better. So you would start your month maybe with your flow, your projected flow, but as things come up, you can add or omit. Is that correct? Ex exactly. And, and, and one, thing, one thing that's really important, if, you, if you're using this for cash flow, managing your cash for your business, I encourage you to only put amounts in here that you know you're going to have to pay or you know you're going to collect. If you want to use this same model as I do with clients that haven't started in business and they're like, how much money do I need to start this business? We use the same model. We put all of their expenses in, which could include tenant improvements on their building, equipment that they need to buy, and using the same model and, and putting it out, time phasing it, we know how much cash they need and when they need it. But yeah, you're right. This is, that's a, you, you, your comment's right. That's exactly how you'd use it. Just, I, I wanna make sure that you're not putting money in, if you're managing, if you're using this to manage your cash, that you're putting real amounts in there that you're gonna have to pay or that you're gonna have to collect. And as best you can, put it in the week when you think it's gonna happen. If you get information that, oh, that $35,000 check that's going to come in in week two is not going to come in until week three, well, then move it in the model over there. And like you said, 
if there's things that are not on this list that are new expenses that come up, then just add a row and add that expense in there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And if this model is helpful or you think could add value to you, we're happy to share this with you after the, after the session. Now, this is great. It's just, it's a pretty straightforward model, huh, Mike? It's, it's, you know, it's not complex. It's not complex. And like I said before, when I was explaining the terms, a cash flow model is just like your checkbook, right? It's, um, it, and all of these accounting terms, these financial reports, my basic takeaway that I hope you get from this class is don't overcomplicate it. They're really, they're very simple. And a lot of times the reason I start with the terms is people get hung up on that. I don't understand credit and debit asset liability. I, I don't understand that. I don't, and then they stopped listening to the concept. And so I tried to present these in a very practical way because this is how I needed to learn it. Because I was, I was like you were um, when I first started out and I would get reports for my business or if I was running a business and I would look at the bottom number. Is it red or black? Did I make money or lose money? And over time, I learned that there's a lot more you can do with these reports than just look at the number on the bottom. So, Mike, if my, for one month, let's just say that my profit and loss shows that I had a net profit of $15,000, but my four weeks of cash flow, just using your four weeks of cash flow here, I'm at a minus $3,500. What happened? It's the timing. Right. And, and so that's a real common problem, right? You, you made a sale and the sale was more than what your costs were for that product or service. So there was a profit, but you're not collecting that money that you invoice for, for another 30 days. So you don't have the cash yet, but on your profit and loss sheet, you did make a profit. On your cash flow model, you just don't have the cash yet. So that that happens all the time in business. And that's why at the beginning of this section, I had a slide that said cash is king. Because managing your cash, if you don't have your cash, if you can't pay your vendors, if you can't pay your employees or your landlord, you're not going to be in business. So you can be profitable as far as you're concerned by looking at your P&L, but that's not necessarily the case when you're looking at your cash flow. Exactly. Exactly. It's like the old joke of somebody going to the bank and say, how can I be overdrawn? I still have checks in my checkbook. It's the same. It's the same concept. The other thing I like about this is this is just a simple spreadsheet. It's not some fancy software that you're using to monitor your week by week by week, right? Exactly, exactly. This is just an Excel spreadsheet. Any other questions for me on any of this stuff? Because I think that's my last slide. That is I have my a question, last Mike. Yes. Um, so your starting cash is that just representative of everything in your checking account? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you yeah, exactly. If you had money in an investment account or something like that, I wouldn't put that here. This is just okay. the cash to manage your business. So I, I know some clients will that starting cash number will be what they have in their checking account, plus some businesses have a line of credit, right? Mm -hmm. where, the, where the bank says, I got $30,000 sitting over here that you have access to. 
if it makes sense for your business, some clients will include what they have in the checking account plus what they have in their working in the in the line of credit with the bank because they're managing their cash that tightly. But but it's either way, whatever works for your business. Okay, great, thank you. You're welcome, Mike. I'd be interested in knowing what you know. Some of our uh, attendees tonight, you know. Uh, Janita and, and uh, AZ, Whittier, AZ Whittier Florist and Claudia from Sweet Breeze Creations, what some of the challenges are maybe that, that you guys are facing with any of this? Is there anything in particular you'd want to bring up to ask Mike? Um, hi, this is Janita from Cajun Fusion. Um, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, usually wow. this is a very overwhelming, complicated subject for me. So you really simplified it, and I'm definitely going to use the model. Good. I'm, I'm, I'm glad. Thanks for that comment. I'm a really simple guy, so I needed to understand this in real simple terms. So I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad it helped. Yes, greatly. Yeah, I'm going to pee back on that and say that I always, you know, when I thought of accounting, it just kind of took my breath away because it's all numbers and it was kind of scary, but this actually simplified it. And I'm like, okay, I could do this. Well, um, and, 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 and to, to add on your comment of I can do this, the SBDC, I mean, we're here to help you too. So, I mean, we're happy for you to come and meet with me or Steve or Max with your, bring us your financial reports and we'll help you go through it and understand it. And it doesn't have to be, I mean, we're, we're a free service, first of all, um, but it doesn't have to be a long drawn out series of sessions. We can have one session if you're comfortable and you've got the answers you need, no problem. If, you, if it takes two or three sessions and you wanna work on sales or marketing or social media marketing or whatever else, we can do that, but it, it can be short or long, whatever, whatever you need it to be. That's awesome, thank you. You're welcome. You said you could make these Excel sheets available to us? Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure the channel, but we'll get it to you, so. And, and I also wanna point out as well, um, as everybody else is saying is very helpful, I actually do my own accounting and sales every year for um, our business and um, this is actually a great platform for me. Um, before I, I started my own business, I actually used to do the weekly and monthly uh, sales for um, this business I used to work for. So I kind of just used the same layout I used to use for her, which was a whole total different uh, industry that I'm in now. So I, I feel like this, this is a lot easier for me to be able to kind of um, manage um, the money kind of going and coming in than the format I was using. So I, I do wanna uh, thank you and I really, really appreciate you being able to share this with us to make our lives easier. And also about uh, reaching out to you guys about uh, more information uh, regarding like businesses. I, I would like to set up an appointment. Just, um, we really have four years in, in business. So I know we still have a long way and just kind of being able to see how our business has grown from, we started, we opened in 2018, which was before the pandemic. So the pandemic did kind of stop us a little bit, but it did actually open up a different um, door for us, which was um, since a lot of people couldn't travel, they were sending out flowers to like their love, loved ones at, in Whittier. So um, mm. surprisingly, it grew our sales. <laughs> so we actually made more money um, in, in uh, 2021 versus 2020. Uh, but it, 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 it was a, a difference. And um, instead of our business going down, it actually has grown. So um, I, I feel like it because has you just, That's because you joined the chamber, Zimri. <laughs> no, that too. That too. That too. No, honestly, shout out to, to the Whittier Chamber too, because a lot, of, a lot of the members have also helped us by supporting us, purchasing from us. So I am honestly grateful 100% for the chamber as well, especially providing resources like this and um, that are really helpful to us. So thank you so much, Carol, for that. Um, I'm really, really grateful um, being part of the chamber and being able to be informed like this because, you know, we did, we did suffer some challenges, which was um, shortages on flowers, which was, um, you know, uh, pricing uh, skyrocketing for us because of the imports 
and very, very limitation in certain flowers. So we did have to make a lot of changes in our price points with our arrangements. And some people understood it and some people didn't. So uh, we did lose a few customers, but we also gained a lot of new ones. So it, 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 it has, it's valid, it balanced out for us. So um, just wanted to share that with you guys. Okay, thank you. Thanks for your comments. Question for you. Um, so this information, this all these, all this, is what we would be using when we do our tax returns, and we what we would use for sales tax. And my next question is: Is that something that you're going to go into um, in, during one of the trainings? Uh, we're not. We're not. Next week, Max is going to talk about loans and applying for loans, but tax planning and tax management we're not going to touch on in this series. I mean, we have advisors that can answer a lot of the questions in that area. We're, we're not tax attorneys um, on, on our team, but we have some very knowledgeable people that can probably help you through most of the tax situations you're talking about. Yeah, I was thinking more just basic, like how often do you have to do pay the sales taxes? And because I think that's different from actually doing your tax returns. And so I was thinking more of like on a really basic level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, we do have advisors that can help you with that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah, and Max will be teaching his uh, class, not this coming Monday, but the following Monday on June 6th, because next Monday is uh, Memorial Day. That's right. <laughs> I'm interested in knowing, um, just out of you know those who are on the call <clears throat> this evening, how many of you use do do all of this yourselves or do you have uh a bookkeeper that helps you do this i'm interested in, in knowing does uh let's put it this way for anybody who has a bookkeeper um maybe just do a shout out because I'm, I'm 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 interested in seeing how much of this is being tackled by you yourselves as opposed to with a bookkeeper or even an accountant AZ Whittier does it. Uh, you do it them yourself. Okay, got it. And do you wish um, you do it yourself? Do you wish that you had help doing it, or do you feel pretty confident doing it? Um, my my partner always tells me that I should have somebody do it, just because. Um, since I I kind of do a little bit of everything, I, I'm the accountant. I I'm the marketing, I'm the sales, customer service, I network. So I, I, I have a lot of my place and I make arrangements, but so I try to like kind of balance everything and I'm a mom as well. So I mean, I try to balance so many things and I think I'm super mom and super woman over here. And he always tells me like, you look so stressed. Like, are you sure you don't want to pay somebody? Like we could really pay somebody. And I'm like, I like the numbers. I want to see, like, I really, it, it just, I, I guess because I've always liked math so much that just kind of seen and then also kind of makes me feel proud uh, like of our team that we've we've done this together, you know. So I guess um, it does overwhelm me. I'm not gonna don't get me wrong, and it's really time consuming, especially because I I have to double check and I re, I double check twice, uh, but I'm really good with my calculator already. I'm kind of experienced, but besides that. Um, I, it is overwhelming, but I like it. I enjoy it. But um, ho I'm hoping, hopefully, within the next year, if it does keep going the way it's going, I might just end up taking that load off so I could focus on other things just to bring in more stuff to the business. And I really wouldn't have to worry about, like, the sales tax, make, making sure I send out all all my totals to my, um, my um, what is she, my, my tax accountant. Because I send her all the info and she'll take care of it for me from there. But I send out the totals. So I kind of have to prepare myself before my deadline every time. And she does remind me like, hey, Zimmy, don't forget, you know, sales taxes due this weekend. And I'm like, okay. So it does kind of like push me a little bit more to kind of send it in on time. But it, it will save me off a load off. So hopefully in the near future, I do, I will hire somebody to do it. But besides that, as of now, I'll probably handle it until I feel like I really can't do it anymore. Thank you. Thank you for that. Mike, do you have a point of view about bookkeeper owners doing it themselves versus not doing it themselves? Do you have a point of view about that? I, I think it's a, I think it's a comfort level. And I think the situation that you just described to us is very common. Um, I think a lot of people can take it on themselves. 
Um, if it's not something you're comfortable with, I, I would encourage you to uh, find a bookkeeper that can help you because there are reasonably priced bookkeepers. I'm sure there are some of them even in the chamber, um, right? And, um, but I think- There are. <laughs> yeah, and I, but I, the idea of working with a bookkeeper when it comes to your taxes is a really good idea. Mm -hmm. So, because business taxes can become very complicated. Well, I'm gonna jump in. Are there any last minute questions for Mike? Doesn't sound like it. Well, awesome. Well, I just want to thank you all once again for being here tonight. And many thanks once again to our uh, generous sponsor, Friendly Hills Bank. Um, they offer financing solutions, including lines of credit, equipment financing, business credit cards, as well as ACH and online mobile banking, online and mobile banking services. And you can go to friendlyhillsbank.com for more information on that. And I think Brad already said it, but next week we're going to take a little break because it's Memorial Day. So hopefully you'll be kicking your heels up and at a barbecue and enjoying the day. Hopefully it'll be sunny out next, next Monday. But we're going to get back together on June 6th, which is also a Monday from 6 to 7 again with Max and talking about securing a loan and what kind of documents you need to, um, to get that together. So we can work, be working on that. And then June 13th will be our final session and really is a kind of a catch all. So bring your questions. And again, because you are part of this series, you get a complimentary one on one mentoring session. And that could be on any topic. I think Mike said, you know, they have experts in the financial field and in the marketing field and the social media field and different things. So um, business development field. So if you have a particular need or just need particular help or shoulder to cry on or <laughs> shoulder mm -hmm. to pat you on the back. Um, SBDC has that and, and Brad will share with us uh, in one of the next upcoming sessions on how you can schedule yours. But um, uh, otherwise, just really want to thank you all for being part of this. Brad, thank you again. Mike, thank you for leading us through. It really was a, a really uh, stripped down version of how to understand your PL and your balance sheet and really what that means to you and your business and, and how you can use that to take your business to the next level. So thank you all once again and have a wonderful week. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks Bye. everybody. Yeah. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Will you click the red button that we see? Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Max. Thank you, everybody. Great job.